let's talk a little bit about clinical practice and where we use. And I'll, I'll ask uh, Dr. Garen to kind of give us, um, with regard to bevacizumab, how you use this agent in your clinical practice. Sure. So bevacizumab was approved with a very specific chemotherapy backbone, and that was with carboplatin and, uh, and, and paclitaxel, which is a, a standard chemotherapeutic option here in the U.S. Um, it was, interestingly, not necessarily the standard chemotherapeutic option that was being used in Europe at the time. And in fact, when they did randomize uh, to a chemotherapeutic regimen that was used more traditionally in Europe, um, that of cisplatin and gemcitabine, um, there there was not a survival advantage. Um, so in the U.S., uh, you know, many people have used then carboplatin, paclitaxel, and bevacizumab, and I think it is still yet to be seen whether there is anything sort of particularly special about that regimen. We know at least there was another regimen where it was not evaluated, and um, as you know, we were both part of the Point Break uh, study. In that study, um, the, uh, th there was a, a comparison between carboplatin, paclitaxel, and bevacizumab as compared to carboplatin, pemetrexid. Uh, and bevacizumab, and uh, there there was no difference. Uh, people have used that data to, uh, to draw many different conclusions, and if you talk to different people, they tend to draw very different conclusions from that data set. Um, and so in my personal practice, I traditionally, when I have used bevacizumab, have used it with carboplatin and paclitaxel in the frontline setting. Um, Although certainly when I see consultations and second opinion, um, I still see many patients who do use that point break regimen of carboplatin, pemetrexid, uh, and bevacizumab, although that has not been my personal choice in terms of therapy. Okay. Roy, um, your thoughts about, you know, there, there's, there's lots of discussion about the BEV eligible patient in, mm -hmm. in lung. We have the histology issue, we have the hemoptysis issue. T tell us kind of the factors that you go through in your head in terms of um, who's, who, who gets it, and, and what are the factors that would make you not give it? Right, so, so Eddie gave a good summary. I, I think that you know, in, in lung, you know, it really is the, the non-squamous patients that, that traditionally are the ones that we consider BEV eligible, and uh, that's probably how I, I use it most in, in practice. You know, someone who has non-squamous cell uh, cancer, um, you know, who's not eligible for a protocol, you know, we have so many new protocols, but you know, probably would give them the carboplatin paclitaxel with bevacizumab. I've become very comfortable with using that as per the ECOG trial. We did do a trial in, in SWAG, you know, with uh, cetuximab, bevacizumab, and, and, uh, and chemotherapy looking at some biomarker work. And there we, we had a little bit more of a broad, you know, sort of application of this. Someone could be bev eligible, um, you know, um, you know, um, we, we looked at, at, at their age, and we looked at, and, and people could make them BEV ineligible, excuse me, if in fact they felt the patient, you know, was, you know, you know frail, uh, if there were, there were other comorbidities. Certainly anyone who has any history of bleeding, uh, hemoptysis, you, you wouldn't put patients on. If you really wanted to use the drug, though, I think the patients that would have the issues with the hemoptysis tend to be those with the centrally located masses. But, you know, is there a compelling reason to use the drug, you know, you know, no, I'm not sure, but if there was, I, I think you could say you could take a squamous patient who didn't have any central lesions. Intrathoracic disease, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and you could use it. Because they were included in some of the registries, right? right they were included right? in some yeah, of the yeah, registries yeah. post, post, uh, right, post, uh, approval. post approval. Yeah. Dr. Bendel in colon cancer, where, where does Bev fit into your treatment? C certainly, it's like water for colon cancer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so certainly in the first line setting, metastatic yeah, setting. Not from Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <Right>. don't. <laughs> Um, so Sorry. first line setting with chemotherapy backbones, full Fury, full Fox. Into the second line setting, you can continue on with BEV. There's also different choices of ramucirumab, which also has um, positive survival advantage. We also have um, uh, VEGF, VEGF trap or Flibercept, um, which, is, which is also approved there. And then even further down, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, regorafenib, also has approval in the third line setting. So, so certainly with colon cancer specifically, we've seen the continuation of anti-angiogenic therapy uh, through multiple lines. At least three, right? Yeah. Wow. yeah. And Dr. Shaw, your, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, so um, the, the, uh, uh, in terms of the people who are not really eligible for bevacizumab, at least in GI cancers, we know that there's a slightly higher risk of um, 
arterial thromboembolic events, so mm -hmm. MI and stroke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so people who are older, people who have those risk factors, people who have had prior um, history of stroke or MI, we tend to avoid it a little bit. Um, I think that with the approval in the second line setting as well as with the continuation, there are instances where you may not want to do it in the upfront up setting. Uh, for example, if you're planning on uh, metastatectomy mm -hmm. and you, you don't want to have, um, have any issues with regard to wound healing, uh, you may not have uh, initially give the bevacizumab and then give it afterwards. So those are some of the considerations as well. Okay.